Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative in film, television, and in books. And today I am joined by my good friend, Stephen Erickson. Hello, Steve. Hello, AD. You know, one of these days, I'm going to try and encourage you to sound at least a tiny bit enthusiastic about talking to me. Don't worry, don't worry, I'll get there. (laughs) So today, Stephen, um, we wanted to talk a little bit about, because we've been discussing writing, uh, different approaches to writing, different aspects of writing. I thought we could could talk a bit about setting today. Sounds good. Because to me, setting... um, Obviously, when I talk about narrative and I say that all these different things blend into one another, that although we give them the separate titles and we call them different things, ultimately, they all come together to form narrative. And we try to separate them out, but it's not really a checklist. It's trying to identify like a key aspect and then always remembering that the other things connect to it. So uh, setting quite often I use to describe the location of a scene and then world building uh, as a way to differentiate that from the construction of the story world. But again, it's not that they are two different things. They're all, they're part of the same thing. And character, particularly if you are focalized through a character, your point of view is with a character, that is going to alter how the setting is being described Mm -hmm. because it's from their perspective and not everyone is going to see their setting the same way. And so, and that's all reflected and communicated by the prose, by the exposition, by the the words describing the scene. And so everything is actually interlinked. Would, mm-hmm. that, would that be a fair assessment? Oh, absolutely. Um, but you can still, you can still use the terminology as identifiers. So setting at its most basic um, definition within fiction, um, or anything, I guess, I suppose, story, but let's just say with fiction, is the description um, of the environment in which you place your characters in your story. Um, So in that respect, it can it can be presented in a completely neutral flat tone and it's simply the description but of course what's happened is over time people writers recognize that you could do a lot more with setting than just simply describe um and especially if you tied it into point of view so uh you could create in your description of the setting and your word choices uh, you can evoke a tone, an atmosphere, and a mood um, that reflects back on the character point of view. Um, so you could take the same, the same basic physical elements, you know, a tree on a hill or something, um, and completely invert um, the emotional context of that particular description, depending on how you describe it. So. That's one aspect in which um, setting starts to to bleed out into other things uh, in the narrative. Um, but at the same time, I mean, we've learned now that that while the traditional approach to creating setting in a story is at the beginning of your section or at the beginning of your chapter or at the beginning of the novel, um, Writers have completely inverted that. They completely um, changed that stuff around um, for different effects. And these will have different effects. And so as long as you're conscious of those effects, then uh, there's a lot you can do with setting. Yeah, because I think one of the reasons why, like the, um, the, the wisdom of the day was describe your setting first, because create the environment, then place your characters in it and then start the action. And that way the reader is localized, that they can Mm -hmm. picture the scene and then they place the characters in it and then the characters are gonna do something. But if you started with just dialogue, Mm -hmm. it's voices in a white space. Mm -hmm. And you go, "That's, that's difficult for the reader. But there can be a reason for that because as soon as you attach characters to it, if these are established characters, 
then the reader is more likely to read the lines of dialogue in a certain way, depending on how they feel about the characters, rather than judging the exchange outside of that sort of prejudice or bias that we get because we like that yeah. character, we don't like that character. And so by presenting the dialogue outside of that, we focus on the dialogue first. And then when we realize who the characters are, where they are standing, what is going on, we can go back to the start and reread the section and in fact get different meaning and different interpretation from it. Yeah. Um, well, and, but uh, sometimes you don't have to go back and reread the section. You, you, you carry it with you, right? Yeah. It, it's like an after, an after echo. Um, and so sometimes you want to do that for just uh, even comic effect, for example. You, know, you have two characters in conversation. And then as the scene, if you will, the, the, the exposition pans back, you know, they're both clinging to the edge of a cliff and they're having a conversation, right? So you can mess around with that kind of thing. And, and it has a kind of residual effect, uh, even though you're just starting with dialogue, uh, it's been recontextualized as you go. And that creates a response in the reader. Um, you can see it a lot in film. What was the Simon Pegg um, zombie film? Um, Shaun of the Dead. Yeah. The opening scene of that one is the, the use of camera to limit the setting is absolutely brilliant. Uh, it, it's so well done and for comic effect. Because it's it's the dialogue between the sort of the male and female character who are having this no, very the male and male. Male and male character. Yeah, his and buddy. Then, and they're they're having this whole conversation and then it suddenly the camera sort of moves back and you realize there are other people at the table and yeah. what they've been well, talking well, about. Yeah. Yeah, they're talking about Simon's um, girlfriend, and then the camera just switches, and she's right there. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's um, it's a great, great uh, play on on how you can how you can um, limit the 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 setting to such an extent that all you are all you're doing is listening to what's being said, and in in the mind you're creating. The scenario around them that they're having a nice private conversation and then of course when you pull back you blow that up right and it's not a private conversation they're both talking about the woman sitting right beside them um so, and that that's a fact setting itself can actually recontextualize yeah, information it so it's not just this is where the characters are sitting it's using the setting and the reveal of setting to create mm -hmm. an effect yeah um yeah and that, and that's done in 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 film i think all the time um, and the reason being, we get the setting instantly, right? It, with with a visual image, it's all there. All the details that the set designers have put in that are relevant are all there. Once you get that that establishing shot, right? In fiction, the writer has to start assembling that thing in the background, and that's what your exposition expositional um, descriptions are all about but then of course you're, you're then faced with I, I i'm not going to describe absolutely everything in that room uh, this it would take too long it's be boring and you know what's the point so i'm only going to describe certain things and some of those things are going to have to carry more weight uh, than they would otherwise um, just as physical objects so once you start becoming selective and you have to be selective in your description, um, and then becomes uh, almost an obvious uh, continuation of, of that process to uh, make use of very, very specific details in your setting to add subtext to character, to story, to foreshadow, uh, to do all those things. I mean, Chekhov's gun on the wall is, you know, it's a classic example. You put that in there and it's going to be used. So if you can think in terms of, of having that in your mind as you're creating a scene, um, it helps you uh, limit the amount of details you need to put in there. Um, and it gives you a chance to weigh the value of those specific details that you're putting in, the physical descriptions, the objects, whatever, to see if they can serve uh, a purpose for the story, for the character development, um, all those other things 
uh, tone and atmosphere and all the rest. Uh, so setting then starts carrying a lot more weight uh, in terms of what you've done. And of course, one of the problems is so many people are, are, are educated, if you will, or self-educated on film and television, that there is almost an expectation that um, a fictional work can somehow uh, create the same immediate instant impact in terms of setting that you see on film and television. And of course you can't. Uh, and as a writer, you realize you have to build that thing the way that the set designers would build it, uh, detail by detail. And that's part of the fun because that stuff you lay out there and it's it's the things you can, you can mine later if you need to. Um, you don't have to, but it's there. And, and if those details are um, carefully selected, then they will add to, they, they will create that, that verisimilitude for world building and all the rest. It's all part of it. Um, I don't know if that makes sense or not. But... Well, yeah, I mean, I think just to, to touch on one of the big differences between film and television and obviously what, what happens in literature. Film and television, it's a very literal representation. You can see this this is what the scene is. And the the scene doesn't the setting doesn't really change according to character perspective. No. It it, it can. There there are mm -hmm. changing the filter, changing uh, the angle. There, there's a whole language that cinema uses yeah. to convey what writers use prose for. Yeah. And one of the, the big things that makes sense to me a lot is if you have a character who is very very wealthy and they are standing in a room and a character who's very very poor who's standing next to them their perception of whether or not this is a well-appointed luxurious room is going to be completely different because mm -hmm. their perception of reality is going to be filtered through their experience so the incredibly wealthy person might think this is a normal room but the very poor person looking at it might go, this is an incredibly sumptuous room. So depending on where your point of view is, how you're mm -hmm. viewing this setting, it is not literal in the way that a photograph of the room is or an image of the room is. It's filtered through the perception of character quite a lot of the time. And therefore, how the setting is being described, if you're using a point of view, can be very revelatory about character. So it's using the setting, again, like you had said, like double duty, the elements from the setting are actually telling us something else about something else, in this case, say, character. And that is an incredibly powerful tool because we, we I think we've become very used to this sort of literal reading of things. Mm -hmm. And we forget that perception is a huge part of how we judge stuff yeah and i, I think uh, obviously we were talking about this earlier but the literal earlier off camera but the the literal is literalization um that we're seeing uh starting to express itself in, in negative senses right in, in terms of uh fiction when it creates a setting leaves a lot to the reader's imagination because you cannot describe everything. And so you're adding on layers uh, through character point of view, which adds tone and atmosphere and, and the feel of the place. Um, and that all that all takes you know expositional work that, that's, that's gonna show up on the page, but it comes to the reader's mind at that slower pace, uh, the pace of how, how fast they read their sentences, how fast they, they comprehend uh, the details and which details catch their eye and which don't. Film and television, of course, gives that all to you. It's like it's 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 for free. It doesn't take any work. Um, it doesn't take any imagination because it's the imagination is, is provided for you, if you will. And that's what you're paying for. So um, it feels like when something then ends up going from a book onto the screen, um, you'll get people say, well, that's not what that setting looks like. And of course, what's in their mind is what they've created. 
through through the through the reading, and that can be completely different from how it's going to be visualized by somebody else. And so there is no real ownership to that beyond the text itself. Um, and uh, as we were saying, as I mentioned earlier, um, off camera, uh, computer games have a lot to to um, explain the kind of reactions that are happening now on on in various adaptations um, on film and television because it it is a literal engagement with a fixed recognizable surficial reality and those details are the only things that matter because you're maneuvering your characters through that particular game and if that mindset then comes into how you see things like setting uh, in in film then it, it's and then you loop back onto into fiction and your expectations may actually have have shifted to such a degree that you're not picking up a lot of what's actually being presented to you on the, on the page because it's a completely different media and its approach is different. It's, a, it's an assembly of details as opposed to an immediate impression of details. And those are two very different things. And that it's, it is difficult, I think, sometimes. And authors, as you said at the beginning, authors play with mm. that expectation about how it's going to be done or what they think the audience is going to take from it because you know authors are writing to an audience they're not mm. writing as much as they are writing the story that they themselves may want to have read but they're still imagining that someone is going to read it and therefore it's communicating a sense it's communicating quite often visual and, and physical details within a setting but as you said tone atmosphere a feeling um about the environment Mm -hmm. And sometimes that is trying to communicate with objects and items or details within a setting that are going to be representative, symbolic of something. And it's not necessarily that the item itself is really important. It's what it symbolizes, mm -hmm. how that uh, can come across. And therefore, another item that does the same thing, that might be easier to replicate, that's how you can you can connect, even though it's one room, it's tapestries, but in another, it's rich velvet drapes. You go, those are two different objects, but you're going to like a tapestry, big, expensive bit of cloth, rich velvet drapes, big, expensive bit of cloth. It's communicating much of the same thing about uh, affluence and that sort of medieval feel to something. And also, you know, being warm and keeping out drafts. Mm. There's a lot to unpack from things like that. But if a character is noticing swords mounted on the walls and uh, shields and a suit of armor in the corner, that's a very different feeling sort of room mm -hmm. because the author is, or the writer is drawing your attention to those details. That's mm. the important aspect of the room. The rest of it can be kind of nebulous, but this is a martial room. It's full of swords and weapons and armor, and it gives you an impression of the room, not a visual representation of the room. Yeah, and it's it's that the whole side of, of literature that that, or rather, literature does it better than film and television, and that is uh, subtextual stuff, symbolic representation. Film, and even you know the classic films that that make use of symbols, um, they'll pick one or two for the entire film. Whereas in a novel, you can have scores, hundreds, uh, that have symbolic um, function because you can come back to them again and again. Uh, visually in a film, it'll probably be one or two things and the camera will return to it again and again. Uh, Citizen Kane would be a good example and, and the sled, the little snow sled at the beginning oh, of the scene. Spot. Yeah, right. So that's one thing that's going to be symbolic of everything that's going to follow. Um, and I, th I think the an audience sitting through a two and a half hour film or two hour film or 90 minute film, there's only so many of those they can carry. And that's probably one of the limitations on filmmaking um, in terms of how much of that subtextual stuff you, you can reasonably expect the audience to pick up on. And that's 
the one place where fiction uh, wins hands down, because I think a readership can actually carry a lot more by reading at the pace in which a person normally reads. Um, we won't talk speed reading because that's kind of pointless. Um, because you're reading for effect, you're reading for an emotional response to something, um, as opposed to just getting through the pages. So there's a lot more that uh, fiction can do that film and television cannot do. And it's it's kind of a shame where a lot of fiction starts appearing as if it's a film script or um, a future fame film script. And I remember when I was um, taking the film script that we had for Gardens of the Moon, where we were aware that there were just going to be some minor things going on. And I think, I think the, the spinning, was the spinning coin part of that? I don't remember if it was part of it or if I put that in for fiction, fictional purpose in the novel only. It doesn't matter. Um, to translate the script into a novel meant basically abandoning so much of, of the script um, because the requirements and the, the the capabilities of fiction over a film script and a film uh, is it, it, so much greater. And why would you close off those opportunities? Why would you uh, limit what you're doing um, to the requirements of a different media? It, it it didn't make sense to me. And so the novel then started to expand outwards the way it was supposed to, at least in my mind. But um but it, it is yeah, it's very different. Um film scripts sort of evolutionarily sort of connect to stage plays and sort of where structurally things emerged from. And um and of course when you're writing stage plays, you really are limiting um the details of your setting for obvious reasons um and then film just sort of elaborated on that and was able to take take the stage and place it into the real world into real settings and so it could take it could take on all of those um built-in details to uh, of our physical world and we get that immediate initial impression of things um but novels novels it, that the origin of storytelling way precedes all that kind of stuff. And so I, I, I sometimes sort of uh, feel despondent over, over the way film and television has actually uh, looped back to shape uh, how we structure stories in, in novels and short stories. Because um, I think it's very limiting in that respect. And but then again, the readers are also, you know, viewers and, you know, they, they've grown up this way. And, and so there's that, that expectation is laid on. Um, and so you can end up, you can build a scene in a novel that, you know, it's got massive amounts of subtext, lots of detail in creating your setting and all the rest. And, you know, the constant response would be, that was a slog, you know, what are you going to do? Right. But, literature is different from film and television and that's the key it, it's it's a different process of creation um and it should be a different process of consumption as well but uh, and again there are different different types of literary narrative that you can you know aimed at different audiences trying to achieve different effects and you can have very very literal description very very surface level sure. information being told and contemporary fiction does a lot of that yeah well uh, but contemporary fiction relies a lot on a lot of subtext being worked. oh yeah yeah um and i think part of part of the thing that has changed is media literacy uh, has shifted focus away from literature in and into reading film but even then because of the heavy commercialization of film that we don't have as many art house cinemas we don't have as many art house films being made that it's it's made for mass consumption and therefore i think there's been an emphasis on the sort of the literal reading of things rather than enjoying subtext and 
symbolism and moving beyond this is meant to be a literal materialist representation of what happened. Yeah, that, yeah. You know, that there are different modes of storytelling, mythic ver and folkloric and all of these different things that are very far removed from the real. And even when we talk about secondary world fantasy, the idea that, oh, well, it must be on a planet and a planet has gravity. And we start applying, yeah, but it, it has to have these things because it's an actual place. Instead of having that flexibility mm. to imagine that, no, it, it, it doesn't have to conform to our reality. As long as it's internally uh, cohesive within the rules of the diegesis, mm -hmm. those rules don't have to match ours. And those rules can be no. very, very chaotic. Yeah, and very, very interestingly, a lot of, I don't know if fantasy ever got there, maybe in some small respects, maybe not, but science fiction broke free from that, those limitations in the 60s and 70s, I think in, in conjunction with um, exploration of psychedelics uh, by the by the writers. And I remember reading when I was growing up, a lot of science fiction novels that just broke reality apart it, you know when you were in another place another place in, in in space or another planet or whatever um i don't think we've ever really seen anything similar get broken apart that way. which zelazny's amber um amber yeah yeah, yeah. um and also that, that's a great I, example yeah uh, Margaret Weiss, and I think it was Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman and the death gate cycle and the breaking apart of a world into these distinct realms. There, there are texts that do it, but there very few of them are uh, considered sort of formative. We, the no. ones that we, we tend to have found as representative or have steered the genre in a certain way have been the secondary worlds where, you know, this is the thing that happened. And you go, that's... The, Again, it's 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 a limiting factor on what fantasy can do, but you know it's what the market wanted, and so people were steered toward it. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, at the same time, I think you can one has to acknowledge, you know, the impact of film and television uh, on on literature. Um, I know I write, especially my sort of action scenes, very cinematically, as if I was seeing it uh, on a screen. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't have all the subtextual stuff at the same time, right? The, you can balance the two. Um, at least I think you can. Um, and certain scenes and certain settings are more conducive for one than the other. And so you just have to work your way between the two. Um, but if the readers are only there for the action, then a lot of your efforts are lost on them. And, you know, that's the nature of the beast. So. Yeah, and I think, you know, when we think of the length of time that a film is, 90 minutes mm -hmm. or um, two hours or two and a half hours, and then you compare that even to an audio book on two times speed, like mm -hmm. that's that's usually 10, 20, 40 hours, depending on the book, that yeah. just in, in terms of the amount of information that is being conveyed, and that doesn't mean that films can't contain a lot of information, but just in, in the sheer amount of time that you're spending with it, that you can communicate more, I think, to a reader than you can to a viewer. And they can well, include little details. Yeah, there. yeah, I, I guess. But, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the thing with, with the visual media is that, as I mentioned earlier, the, the impact is immediate. And it's taken in by, by, by the eyes and the brain. And um, it's assembled, reassembled. Uh, instantaneously, whereas in, in literature, you're having to slow that whole process down, and um, the means by which you you know you can convey that information um, will have its own inherent pace, and um, and you can alter the pace obviously, but generally when people move into descriptions of setting, they tend towards a more sedate pace because you need it. You need it to get those details in. Um, but once you've laid all that stuff down, then you can shift away and, and your pace can go way up and it can it can reflect the actions of the characters in that respect. So yeah, they, I mean, everything's tied together, but um, description of setting is you know a major part 
maybe almost all well almost depends if you want to count character actions as part of setting but i don't know anyways it's a major part of exposition so anything that's not dialogue and you know the Weirdly enough, uh, one of the techniques established by the Western that you know Peter Jackson used mm. in The Lord of the Rings was showing the huge world and then these tiny figures in it. And you know that's that's from the Western, seeing the either like Nevada or New Mexico or wherever it was, like showing uh, the the stunning sort of epic nature of the landscape, mm -hmm. and then the small humans inhabiting it, and then crashing down into close-ups of the the people mm. and we have that with with peter jackson's lord of the rings that you had those big sweeping shots of new zealand and these little tiny figures and then close-ups to the figures to place them in that setting yeah that who knew that every who knew that every secondary fantasy world looked just like new zealand i mean isn't that <laughs> extraordinary well, it's an improvement over medieval europe yeah i suppose <clears throat> um but uh, again it's I think even now, the, the use of New Zealand, I think, is becoming almost a, a trope or a cliche now. Oh, it is, has it ever? A lot of fantasy, simply because of the impact of, of Jackson's mm. movies that then, you know, everyone else wanted to copy because it was like these big mountains and then flats and river flats and then the coast. Everything was within a short distance for the locations. And so you had access to lots of different things without having to fly hundreds of hours around to, mm. to scout different locations. Mm. But it, it's interesting that setting is usually in and around the characters and the action. But when we talk about world building, that's that's setting in a much broader, bigger sense of the story world, the reality in which something is placed. And of course, that leans into the type of storytelling it is. Is it materialist? Is it realist? Is it... Um, mythic is it symbolic that we have this expectation about the the broader world setting and yeah. the tension then between because m john harrison spoke about this about this desire and movement in modern fantasy to focus on world building instead of setting and he thought yeah this was but firm. yeah i i find that definition that's been used often about world building to actually not not be one I agree with. Um, I think a lot of people, uh, possibly Harrison himself, um, they viewed world building as uh, an extension of expositional setting description uh, to the nth degree, right? Uh, to me, that's not world building. That um, That's note taking. That's not world building. World building for me comes in how the characters interact with their environment. That's where you get your world building. It's it's how they respond to various things that they see or witness to have to engage with or whatever. That's where the world building comes in because it's placing these people that the reader is identifying with uh, into the setting in an organic way so that they are, this is where they live. And so the things that will be of, of interest uh, or note or noteworthy to them will be linked closely to, well, entirely to their life experience in that world. And so your world building is actually, it's assembled through how characters interact. So, I mean, if, if you have a bunch of characters, I don't know, on, on horses on that big New Zealand landscape and they're right up to um, the edge of a cliff and they look over and they see this this vast river and then this 300 foot tall statue at the far end or something. Um, and they go, oh my God, I've never seen anything like this. You know, and they, and they, they pull out their equivalent of cameras and start taking pictures. Um, you've kind of failed in the world building at that point right they have to look at that and if it's something they are familiar with or knew was coming then they won't react to it in the same way that uh, an audience would react to it so they 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 take these things as part of their world part of their environment 
Um, if you live in Paris, you don't go and goggle the Eiffel Tower because it, it's part of your environment. It's just, it's there. Um, and if your characters can respond that way, not just to physical descriptions of places, but to actual events that are occurring. Um, I, I think this is one example would be I had soldiers on a rooftop in one of the books later, um, later books uh, in the Lazen series, um, who look over to the sky and they see a dragon flying towards them. And uh, I think the response is to fire the crossbows full of munitions and blow the crap out of the thing. One of the guys says, you know, fucking dragons. That's world building. All right. It's not the presence of the dragon. It's not the rooftop. It's not the city. Well, it's part of the, partly those things, but it's how your characters are actually engaging with their environment that actually provides the world building. Does that make yeah, sense? And, yeah. And that's, I think that's part of what Harrison was getting at. It's part of what John Clutes talked about as well is, and again, it comes down to how we, we are dividing out these different aspects of narrative. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, sometimes our definitions are, are going to be different to others. But Clute talked about this encyclopedic impulse mm. in certain fantasy to detail aspects of the world and to, to go into, look at this really cool thing that I've built that isn't in service of the narrative. And when mm. I say in service of the narrative, that's not furthering uh, a narrative event. It's not plot. It's not story. But the narrative itself, the the picture, the the thing that you are constructing. And I think that's what Harrison was getting at as well, that what should the only things that are in it are the things that are necessary for the creation of the effect that you're going for so mm -hmm. i think he very much agrees with you that you don't need this whole oh and this the city of flurble a uh, hundred miles to the east where the dancers are there and you know this long sort of description of look at this really cool city that i thought up and i'm going to tell you about even though it's a hundred miles to the east and is not going to figure in this story that's what I think Harrison uh, was complaining about. As yeah, I can't. I, the thing is, I can't think of many examples of that. It's almost it's, like a an invented straw man kind of thing. It's uh, except we do see it in a lot of fantasy where it's here is something that I have invented for this world, and I'm going to spend pages detailing how it works. I don't so, read those. <laughs> I you don't read those, but those sorts of books do exist. And mm -hmm. it's it's because there is a desire in a number of readers to to have that, I want to know how the world works. I want more details about this. I want the background on it. And so the, there are authors who cater to that. And mm -hmm. But that is... We don't even know how this world works. <laughs> Badly, apparently. Mm -hmm. But... You can see that that's that's a different approach to a different type of storytelling than what I think you and, and Harrison are doing. Which no, is... it's not it's not storytelling. It's it's travelogue writing. It's, it's it's a different thing. Travelogue writing that has bits of narrative thrown in, or it's a narrative with a lot of travelogue put in. Because we do have travelogue narratives. Sure. A lot of quest narratives are about exploring the different parts of the world sequentially as the quest party moves through them. Like we have that. And that's each setting is then this unique setting that has been described. You, we are in our jungle location and now we have moved to our desert location with the desert tribe and then the um, exotic desert city full of turbans and dates because we're drawing from that. And then we move on to the Grecian city state that has been transposed into fantasy land. And they 30 are being, miles away. Yeah. 30 miles away from the desert one. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, we days. have... We have fantasy novels that do this where they take analogs and they plunk them down. Star Trek did it all the time. Oh, look, it's a Greek planet. Oh, look, it's it's a Roman planet. Oh, look. It's... No, 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 no. No, no, no. You got that wrong. Got that wrong, AP. It's a well-known fact that every planet out there looks just like Northern California. Everybody <laughs> knows this. But, and again, it's, so the setting in that sense of these they're almost discontiguous narrative spaces where there isn't really a blending where you go from one into the other. It's like, here is the border. It's you've reached the border of this one. You take one step and you are now in different setting. And yeah, it's forest land. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, it is useful for the writer to actually 
have taken all those notes and to know about all those details because that's your encyclopedia that you're going to draw from. Obviously, you do not want to um, plagiarize your own encyclopedia for, for purposes of fiction, right? So it's like, it's like a reference book. Um, so by all means, take those notes, um, build your world, um, have your continents, uh, have the rivers, have the mountains, have the forests, um, even go so far as to work out climate, climate patterns and, and all the rest, you know, go to those details if you want. Um, and that is what you're going to draw from when you create your characters and you put them into a setting. So you'll know as the writer, you will know that place backwards and forwards. And you got to be that confidence should be sufficient to help you choose the details that are going to be important to the story and to the characters. Um, and let the rest slide because it may slide for these, you know, first 200 pages, but it may come back, you know, uh, page 300, but you've got that information. So, you know, it, um, so yeah, I, I don't really have an issue of, of, with people really thinking out their world. Um, cause God knows Cam and I did it and it certainly paid off, I think. So, but, and also there's a difference between if you're planning one story, one yeah. narrative in, uh, in a setting. Uh, in a world setting, or if it's going to be a number of different stories, because uh, if you've if you're going to have a, a story about a heist in a city, you don't need to work out all of the aspects of the entire planet that this city is in. You just need what is relevant to make that city unique for yeah. the setting. But then, if you're going to have a whole series of other novels that are going to be set. At the thieves leave after their heist and that's where the next novel picks up then you you need something to exist outside those walls it can't just be white space so yeah, but but you cannot you cannot anticipate or expect writers to know what their next book's going to be or their next their book 10 years down the road so what i would recommend is if you are going to do this this heist thing in a small town build the nation first and build a culture because you don't know if that's going to be one story or 20, right? You don't know what your future holds. You may end up having fallen so much in love with that, with that place and those characters that you're going to come back to them. In which case, if your first story recognized that to begin with the potentiality of this becoming much bigger than what you think it is, then you, you don't have to retcon shit, right? You've got it. It's all there. You don't have to use it for that first first story. And, and that's the other part of all kinds of uh, details. Um, and even plot ideas that you have in mind is there is that, that impulse to get that out on the page as quickly as possible. And what I've learned anyways, uh, just through all these years of writing is, no, the more you hold back, the better. Um, so, because it means you've got stuff you can, you can then use in the future and you don't have to rebuild, you know, the entire machine or the entire world. Um, so there is a lot of preparation, I think, even, even if you were to do that kind of short story, but a short story, that's a standalone in, in a fantasy setting. One way to get around all that, knowing that being aware that your future is unpredictable, you don't know where you're going to go with your stories. Um, is to be vague enough in your details that you've got a lot of wiggle room yeah. for later. And, and I think that's one of the things that we see in some great stories is that there are little throwaway details that yeah. at the time that the author was writing, there was no way that they had worked out what any of those things were. But, you know, you have the character walking down is, oh, the, the city of Flurbel's in trouble again, you know, just as a throwaway line as part of a dialogue sequence about something else. But then if that author ever returns to that world, and so they go, but Flurble's already been established and there's a little detail here. So I can do that. And the reader goes, oh, we're now going. I remember that reference or mm -hmm. uh, the the strange tri uh, triangle symbol above the, the ship's or the, the Smith's workstation. Why was it a triangle? And, you know, that suddenly leads into, oh, that's a symbol of that. 
little tiny details that don't necessarily have to be worked out ahead of time add to the feeling of complexity of a setting yeah <clears throat> and give it that lived in where you don't know everything mm -hmm. and then they are options for writers later on down the road to go i'm going to draw on that um it, like one of the things that in one of the issues of the sandman there was a box of different artifacts at the bottom of one of the panels and then I think uh, Neil Gaiman had specified there had to be like one or two different things in it, but the artist had used and filled in just with other random bits and pieces. That then, when Gaiman saw it, was like, oh, that actually gives me an idea, that object, that gives me an idea for a different story down the road. Mm -hmm. And then when we as reader come across that, we go, oh, that was linked all the way back then as if it had always been planned that way. It, it created a, an impression of continuity. Okay. Of genius, yes. <clears throat> well, and, well, I mean, we make use of that every chance we get, right, as, as writers. Of course and, we planned it. <laughs> well, having having met a few of you, I know that seat of your pants barely describes some of you. <laughs> but that's one yeah. of the things I like about setting is that we, we talked about that very literal approach of just describe what's in there. But melding it with sim, uh, symbolic meaning and symbolism that was an added element. And then having things in it that aren't explained, but mm -hmm. are distinctive, that maybe catch the reader's eye and imagination. Yeah. That, that can which feed... you can, yeah, which you can then come back to. Yeah. <clears throat> so, and, and I think that's a wonderful thing about how the setting can actually drive narrative in the oh, future. Yeah. Um, so not just Chekhov's gun of, because you saw that thing, you have to use that thing. But... Why, why were there square coins, a pouch of square coins sitting there that the character remarked, like sort of spotted and went, that's odd. And then later on, something like, oh, square coins, because it was this thing. And suddenly it gives a whole load of new meaning to something. Yeah. yeah. But I think one of my, my favorite aspects of setting and description is when it is used to evoke who the character is. Mm -hmm. And not just that uh, relative description of whether or not a character thinks a room is opulent when they are very rich, but even things like um, what a character chooses to see mm -hmm. in a room, what they yeah. think is noteworthy, that tells you a bit about them and what a character chooses to do and interact with the setting can tell you. if. They re just as an aside, you know, move the um, the cup of wine uh, just to the side so it is centered on the table to give away sort of their their need for things to be ordered. Or as they walk around the room, they they slowly straighten things up because they're talking uh, to the prisoner in the room. But they're slowly straightening the things up because they desire law and order and everything to be structured. But that's suddenly very revelatory, using the setting as a way to communicate something about the character yeah yeah i think that one's almost being overused these days you see it a lot in television film of setting out the pencils and all the rest and it's it's become this sort of establishing shot for a particular style of character i think i have to use obvious examples steve okay 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 um one of the things i was going to mention though in in the context of um uh, using description of the setting if through a particular point of view in order to convey the the attitude and even belief systems or general feeling of that character is that quite often somebody uh, one can get carried away with that and end up um, attributing uh, emotions to inanimate objects. It's, it's a pathetic fallacy, which well, personification. Yeah, yeah, but you know the description of the sky weeping tears. You know is is it's just a little bit too far. You know what I mean? It, it's you're trying to you're trying to get that emotion out of the environment, um, but you cannot anthropomorphize it. You cannot you cannot humanize it in a sense. I don't know. I mean, the sky weeping tears. I would object to the use of the word tears. You go the sky weeping. You you already uh, covered. Yeah, I'm still. I'm. But, I mean, 
that's that's a personal choice about a stylistic yeah. approach. I I don't have a problem with personification being used or a pathetic fallacy even being used that when a character is uh, down and sad and you have the rain falling, like we see that. Yes, it can be cliched, but just because it's a cliche doesn't mean it can't be well used. No, but yeah, I mean, I I, I maybe I'm just oversensitized to that kind of stuff. Um, if you can have a character in a in a in a state of trauma or sad or or grief or whatever just have it rain you don't need the rest right the rain the rain does the rain just does the job for you um, yeah but i can i can also imagine uh two characters one of them going oh the sky is weeping tears and the other one going oh shut up and, yeah yeah and, you can and, definitely do that and using it to, uh, through dialogue yeah. or yeah. um because uh, you have a, a great you had a scene where um a character who comes from a tribe, a tribal character, and he's sitting there posing on the mountaintop, looking out, because he knows the other another character is coming up, and so he's assumed this pose, and he's yeah. like then waiting for the other character to appear, so he can be this the noble savage staring at, and he's done it all deliberately because he's playing up to a stereotype, and yeah. that's funny. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you can do it in that sense, but what I'm talking about is. The point of view character is providing the exposition yeah. of the description. Um, in which case, that's not dialogue. And unless unless they're sending sending up the reader, which is a weird, it can be done, yeah. uh, but do it judiciously. Or, um, but if they are if they are Aramis, Aramis is is going to be that waxing poetic view. But Porthos is going to be. Where's the wine? And Athos yeah. is going to be very matter of fact about it. Yeah. But you could have Aramis could be looking around and go, oh, the the gentle swaying of the trees. Like that's how Aramis is going. Porthos would go, there's some trees over there. And Athos is going, I wonder are there enemies hiding in the shadows of those trees? That mm -hmm. each of them would see the trees differently. And that's yeah. how you can use focalization of character through character to change how you describe setting. Um and you know. I, I understand it can it can be dangerous like, because you could end up waxing too poetical. But well, that's one of the things where sort of the there can be an, an inherent style in the writer, and in which case every character is is attributing you know those emotions to everything around them, and yeah, that can be a bit of a um, a bit of a chore uh, to read. But then we so can I, have a fun. I, I guess what I'm recommending is is. Be mindful of what you're up to. Yeah, yeah, and that's I think that's the major thing about all aspects of writing is be mindful. If you yeah. if you are aware of the effect that you are creating, if you are consciously trying to create that effect, that's what you're always going for. You need to, and I think being mindful of what you're writing is with all aspects of writing, and you know. Sometimes you are not successful. Sometimes you are. It it because you can't predict your reader, but you can try, yeah. and you can try to use the different techniques that you know to to achieve those things. But one of the the great joys of of fantasy writing is the ability to literalize abstract concepts, um, and of course that can play into setting as well, where you can have living castles, you can um, have magical objects that are sentient. That you you can play around with the actual setting and have strange magical effects and weirdness in it that transcend what we would sort of the literal material that we kind of think of and do something different and you can do that to effect. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad you agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, is there anything more that you really wanted to talk about setting? I think. The, the only point I would bring up is um, bare analogs will always come across as bare analogs that, you know, people will recognize when you have basically lifted Rome, uh, like first century Rome and stuck it in your fantasy novel. Yeah. And you don't have to do that. You can take that as the bare bones and then shuffle it around a bit. Mm -hmm. um, that I think is, you know, take it as a starting point, but then move on from it or, um, 8th century Lagos or um, 
you know, look at different cultures and cities around the world, but don't just replicate a bare bones version of them. That, no, that, no. Um, but that, I mean, we're moving there more into world building in that respect. But, but again, that's part of that's part of creating the setting, unless you're mm-hmm. talking specifically about the scene. Yeah. Um. So. Yeah, you, you can see why I see setting is scene specific and world building are uh, sort of relates to everything else that could become a setting if the characters are standing there. Mm. And that's kind of how I divide it up in my head. But also world building in that sense of when characters are interacting and doing things, it has to sell the authenticity mm-hmm. of that reality. That is building it as a world instead of an artificial, they are standing on a stage. There is a background made of cardboard that is one inch thick surrounding them and they are going through their lines. If that's the artificial uh, artificiality that you want, then by all means, but be aware that authenticity and internal coherence and a conviction often sells the story more than something that is really intricately worked out and then explained to the reader. Oh, absolutely. Um, but also, uh, it's the character's own comfort in their environment that you can do a lot with, uh, or discomfort yeah. uh, in terms of social standing and that kind of thing. So again, it, it's that mindfulness of if you're going to use a particular point of view, it's a good idea to know where they come from and what their experiences are and what yeah what they have witnessed of this world. Because there will be parts of that world that they have never witnessed, just like for most of us. There are, there are places we've never been to, and we have no idea what it's like to be there. And so you can, in those instances, it's probably why there were so many um, farm boys who ended up, you know, being dragged out into the world, because that was beyond their experience. So it gave the author the opportunity to um convey the wonders of the outside world through the eyes of this young maturing um and and that's character. why like those quest novels or uh, that structure of travel log of here's the wide-eyed wonder this is the new place let me explain this to you and therefore the guide to the character becomes the guide to the reader and that's why they're so comfortable it's a very effective way of doing that yeah. style of- and i think what's forgotten and you know, I, I I dump on that that trope quite often, but I think what's what is forgotten is in the time, say of Jordan, um, writing this stuff. There were places all over the world that most of us have never seen, and that has changed, right? Because people got phones now, they got cameras, they got uh, Google Earth, um, they got you know they have access, they can see almost any any corner and experience it in some fashion. It was not the case um, at the time of, of the writing of these novels. So always bear that in mind that there's that sense of wonder was something that actually, if you bought a plane ticket to a place that you've never been to before, um, you actually could experience. I mean, I remember landing in, in, in the Yucatan um, the first time ever uh, in Central America and just uh, how extraordinary uh, it was and, and um, how curious a lot of things were that, that you, you, just, you just took for granted in, in, in your own setting where you grew up um, that were completely different. I, I remember, this will date me, um, in Merida, uh, in the market, uh, bargaining for, I think it was buying mosquito netting or something. And I couldn't speak Spanish, and the uh, person I was buying from couldn't speak English. So we communicated through, um, uh, what were they called? Um, calculators. And so they would just type in a number, hand it to me. I type in my, my counter offer, and we just go back and forth. And that's how you would buy things. And I mean, that was really quite cool. Um, and then, of course, you're in the Yucatan and you get on a bus and the next thing you know, you're, you're in a, a thousand year old site with pyramids. And this is just part of their environment. They live this, you know, 
and there's locals sitting outside uh, the gates to the site and, and they're selling Mayan replica artifacts of pottery and all the rest. Um, so that idea of being young and traveling out into the world and seeing things for the first time is something that Jordan captured with his his travelogue, his his narrative, and his choice of point of view uh, for his characters. Um, I think that, that that needs to be recognized. Um, you know, the, the modern audience does not have that experience. Um, there are places that you probably have not ever seen, uh, but if you wanted to, you could find them just with a click uh, online. So, so I, think... I was completely interrupted there as I was reminiscing. And had I the, had I the, the function and the capability of stopping and starting recordings, I would have just kind of kept going and, and gone at, at length in my reminiscing of my my great old days traveling through Central America. What? I'm Not that I've done that before. I'm interested in those stories, Steve. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Pretty yeah, exciting. but then you would have slowly exploded, so it would have been quite amusing to watch. But I actually hadn't heard you talk about the Yucatan. Hmm. Um, but that feeling, that feeling of wonder and awe and sometimes fear of stepping hmm. out into a new place that is completely alien to you, that is I think it's something that we still kind of experience um, when we travel. But hmm. I think we've become perhaps a little cynical, perhaps a little jaded, about these new worlds that are being explored that if a, a character is kind of awestruck and overcome by it we're like oh. because we as viewers are are i think much more cynical now yeah um and almost spoiled in yeah, the variety of things that we've seen yeah. but I, you can that juxtaposition you can have a character that is very lived in that particular area and another character that is going what is this place and so the setting will remain static, but how it's, again, how it's perceived by the different characters, it's going to create different effects. And mm -hmm. as you said, like Jordan picking one over the other to describe a setting mm -hmm. changes that atmosphere. Yeah. Um, and we can see the attraction of those, those travelogue things to have the, the character go from the wide-eyed, callow youth to the the cynical world weary traveler like wait, that's a that's a fairly well yeah but story. i wonder now if it's almost if it's time is done if you know what i mean um i would think science fiction could still pull it off um with amazing visual effects and all the rest um even described in novels but i think in fantasy we've seen we've seen the settings too many times I think part of that is a failure of imagination on our parts um, in that, you know, we keep going back to like, pseudo-European settings or generic jungle setting, um, generic ancient civilization that is modeled after, definitely not modeled after Rome. You know, part of that is a failure on, on our part because there's no reason why fantasy settings can't be as alien as the alien worlds in science mm -hmm. fiction. Uh, like one of the things that always struck me, um, we go to Florida for that conference, uh, the ICFA, and stepping off the plane in into Florida. So I've gone from cold, wet, windy UK, and you step off the plane and you are struck by mm -hmm. the heat and humidity mm -hmm. that it's you take one step out of the airport and it's it almost slams into you. It's it, it's redolent, isn't it? You can smell the swamps around around the airport. It's amazing. Um, and then within a couple of days, it's it normalizes. It, mm -hmm. it it's a really bizarre feeling. And obviously, within a lot of fantasy, we have characters that step through portals, and yet so so rarely do we get them when they step out, suddenly being rocked back by the fact that the feeling of the atmosphere, the humidity in the air the temperature is so radically different from where they just left it's kind of mm -hmm. they step out and go ah we are now going over here and mm -hmm. and even as someone like, we've traveled there quite a bit but i still am struck every time stepping up because it is so different uh, yeah. just stepping into it yeah absolutely 
setting, I think, can serve so many different functions beyond a simple, literal description of what is there. Um, mm -hmm. Symbols that can be picked up and used to develop the world later on, uh, develop narratives from later on, ways of articulating and showing who a character is and how they interact with it and how they perceive it. Yeah. Um, creating that sense of atmosphere. Where... Yeah, it, it can do another thing. Um, it can create authority in the, in, in the voice that's telling you something. Um, I know we've used it before, but take the short, happy life of Francis Lacombert. Um, Hemingway's knowledge of the details of the camp on safari in Africa, uh, he conveys through his, his very, very basic, um, simple descriptive language of the details of the camp. And what that conveys to the reader is, this is an author who knows what he's talking about. And so a lot of this is, and there's a, a subtle psychological effect on that because if you have that faith in the authority of the voice of the author, um, you will you will go further into the story uh, than you would otherwise, and so quite often, if <clears throat> if a physical description of an environment is described and it's not well thought out, that the reader can easily lose their faith in the authority uh, of the author. So it pays to it pays to at least convey the illusion that you know what you're talking about. And that can take a bit of work, for sure. Yeah, and I mean, that's one of the things that we've talked about in terms of descriptions is having a sequence to them, knowing yeah. knowing where you are going with them. Not necessarily that it is just following a character's eyeline, but having a, an internal consistency, yeah. a progression. And you don't have to keep to it rigidly, but as long as it flows in that direction, it the reader follows along with it and is comfortable with it. And it makes sense because they can feel that control of where it is going. Yeah, and yeah. suddenly that, even if that's not how you personally would assimilate the information if you were there, but because it's, it's sort of carrying you along with it, you feel comfortable with it. You believe in it. And that's, I think, a very important aspect of making these worlds come alive. When, Let's face it, they are squiggles, black, black and white symbols on a page. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's where I think uh, writing can draw a lot from um, film and television, from the cinematic technique, um, because the reader is very familiar with that now. So tracking, panning, um, close up, uh, middle, you know, uh, middle MCU, middle close up, um, all kinds of... Uh, and then and there you can then move into things like psychic distance uh, and camera angles, um, looking down on characters, looking up at characters. Uh, the O's all, all have psychological uh, impact and effects for the reader. So the writer can make use of these things. And so they are automatically familiar uh, to the reader as the reader proceeds through the, the description. So, you know, if, if you're... Um, starting out focusing on a very you know close in object and then you slowly pull back and then you can start populating the description of the setting rather with the details that come into view as you pull back mentally in your head as the writer and the reader the reader's on board with that because uh, that's what we're familiar with and we, we could contrast that because that would seem like a very smooth easy way to do it but if you had well, there was this thing on the table and then this thing back here and then that thing over there. And that would feel very jumpy yeah. and disjointed. Yeah. But starting and thinking of a slow sequence where you move out or someone staring into the distance and then slowly pulling back to where they are. Yeah. There are lots of different ways of doing it. And, you know, we, we started uh, part of this conversation by saying that, you know, literature is different to film and TV. Mm. And it shouldn't just mimic no. film and TV. But it doesn't mean that it can't use techniques from no, film. No, of course not. Film and no, because you have to acknowledge. Yeah, you have to acknowledge 
uh, the knowledge base of your audience. And, you know, every writer starts as a reader, one hopes. Um, but certainly every writer starts as somebody who has watched television and films and, and whatever. Um, and so they are intimately, uh, innately almost familiar with those techniques. Um, and why would, why would you not use them? All right. They make sense. They work. So, yeah. And with, with setting, although we've talked very much about the visual aspect of this physical reality, okay. Again, like the different senses come into play of making a setting come alive. But <clears throat> this the smell, the tactile, the the temperature, like all of those different things, not just what they can see and hear. But you, you have to bring in our you don't have to. You can bring in the other senses. And it doesn't always have to be each and every sense. But remembering to include it something makes a setting come alive more, I think, than yeah. Just yeah. relying on audio visual. In fact, in, in many respects, some of those other senses are far more powerful. I mean, I remember the first time driving into with uh, the archaeology crew into Belize City in Belize. And even before, I mean, we had the windows wide open because it was hot as hell. And as we rolled in, you sudden had you had the sudden realization um, that you were driving into a city with open sewers because that's that's what hits you first. It's not it's not even the visual; it's the smell. Um. So if you were to describe coming into that to that city in in the early eighties, I don't know if they're open sewers anymore. Um. You would you would want to begin with that, just the the um, olfactory impact of uh open sewers and and rotting vegetation and rotting garbage and you know all of these things um you get used to them but initially yeah when you're first arriving absolutely yeah, you, you become nose blind yeah um or even if you've grown up with it, it, it it's linked to a different memory i mean i yeah. remember driving through the countryside and they had just one a farmer had obviously been out spraying like slurry and oh like the mm. smell oh you're going like your eyes are watering and i remember my dad going ah oh, the smell of the country because that's where he grew up he grew up with that yeah. and so for him there was an element of nostalgia through that biting yeah. acrid oh mm. whereas the rest of us were just you know we were city boys yeah <laughs> we're going, oh i don't like the smell of that um and so it's it's weird how olfactory the olfactory sense the sense of smell can can again be describing the same thing but uh, perceived in different ways and that's the strength of character and perception in in writing in writing and that that's the thing that that film cannot ever convey is that the impact of that um, and well, it, it can convey it, except it has well, to be very kind of. obviously. Yeah, it has to have like a character turning around and going, "Oh," and directing it, and and again, very literal. We have to literalize and give you the the surface. It can't just be communicated subtly. Yes. Yeah. Um, it, it tends to be very very overt, whereas with writing, it can be hidden and and incorporated into things. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I mean, the example I'm, I'm, I tried to give with that is that sometimes you want to begin your description of a setting, not necessarily always visually. It can be in terms of smell. It can be in terms of sound. It can mm -hmm. be in terms of all, you know, all the other senses can can be used. Um, you know, you, you you create a room with no light in it, then it's going to be tactile. And that's that's how you have to run with it. Uh, until you're given, you know, other op uh, alternatives. So <clears throat> there are way there there are different ways of approaching uh, setting when you're tying it to a particular point of view, for sure. Yeah, and one last thing to sort of to talk about on this is the fact that in fantasy, obviously, you can have things that are not physical spaces become setting, because we have those fantasy stories where characters meeting in a mind space or a dream space. And these are not physical realities. 
these are magical constructs or strange fairy constructs that yeah mythical mythical constructs yeah mythical which constructs. are yeah which are ar archetypal front and center so you know we talked earlier about uh the calor scene to start uh, memories of ice and don't take that literally you know it's not it's not meant to be yeah because and but again you give clues in that where he is sitting on a throne of skulls and you yeah go, right think that that's figurative language it's metaphorical language because otherwise he went out and got a whole load of bodies and, and took the heads and cleaned them so he got the skulls and then he stacked them all together and a wee bit of uh, super glue to make sure yeah. they didn't fall apart and you, yeah. no that doesn't make any sense but the idea of being like sitting on a pile of bodies being respect you go yeah it's symbolic it's but symbolic. it still gives you a physical representation but you don't take it literally no um and again that is we're used to that for dream sequences mm -hmm. in say film and television when the dream sequence ends, we expect, yes, that is the physical reality. And we forget that mythic storytelling mm -hmm. uses a lot of the same symbolism. And that's not always as easy to tell apart when it's just words on a page. And we, we were talking before we, we started about um, part of Tolkien's world, where a character has a glowing jewel on wearing on a band on his forehead in a boat and he is sailing through the sky as a star mm -hmm. and you go right that is clearly not literal in the sense of a secondary world because well how did the ship get up there how is the the star being seen how is he breathing out in space orbiting this planet you don't ask those questions because it's no. not meant to be that type of reality it is mythically true and to have an expectation of, well, well, how is he breathing in space? That's willing suspension of disbelief. You go, I'm, it's not, it's not history. No. It's narrative and uh, an aspect of it is going to be artificial and it's, don't think about it in literal terms, but that can be very hard to convey. Well, especially, you know, the Tolkien example is good because that is very much uh, an evocation of, of of a mythical world, mythical settings, um, and mythical fates to characters and all the rest. So to hold to some kind of pedantic adherence to you know our our physical reality seems misplaced. You know, obviously you're going to need some of that stuff for just the immediate sort of details of, of characters and what they're doing and moving and, and, and walking and swimming or whatever. Um, but it doesn't mean you hold to those same particular rules for the world itself. Yeah, because we don't ask questions like, well, how is Bag End uh, plumbed? Where is the fresh water coming from? Where are the sewers? Where are the toilets? How did they... What does Frodo do in order to have all of this food? Where is he getting all of the food? You don't ask those questions because that's irrelevant mm. to the story. It's not a real world in those senses. And in fact, the, the poop question is a, a question that you could ask of almost any fantasy mm. setting. Because quite often you have these amazing cities. You go, right, where are the sewers? Where, mm -hmm. where are the bathrooms? Where's all of the running water coming from? Well, and, yeah, but you see, you have to realize that no character in, in fiction ever poops. So you wouldn't need the sewers. You don't need any of that stuff. It's just not there. Not required. It's all this sort of ex osmotic exudence of waste. It's, it, it, it's okay. It's all worked out. Don't worry. That I, I think it is something we sometimes forget is that with films, television, books, if you choose to take that approach, you can tear apart even like the, the most well put together fiction. You can tear it apart because you go, mm -hmm. oh, well, that's a narrative contrivance. Yes, all narrative is contrived. Oh, well, how did that thing happen? That's convenient. Yes. Yes. It's narrative. It the things will be convenient to it. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I know. It, it, it's, it's, it's a strange way to, to measure. Uh, measure a story you know because stories 
especially in fantasy, I mean, you're beginning with that suspension of disbelief. That's where that's where it all begins. So why why impose it and try to push that back in there uh, over and over again? I mean, it depends. I mean, we do have a large large is large the right word. We have a tendency um, to adhere to uh, realist and realism approaches to to fiction, um, which is very different from from the mythological and the legendary and the folkloric. Um, but that's kind of you know that's kind of the the default mode now is is that element of um, absolute realism uh the nitty gritties of uh of everything but but, but even then it it's the modern day version of it because yeah, you have yeah. things like well that's not that's not how armies would behave you go mm -hmm. you don't have to go that far back in time to see armies doing being trained to do really dumb things like mm -hmm. oh no man's land everyone get up out of the trench and walk towards the enemy very slowly mm -hmm. while they shoot us yeah that no one would look at that and go, oh, that's a brilliant, that, that is an audacious and, and fantastic strategic plan. Well mm. done. But that's what they thought they should do. You go back to how the, um, the American wars were fought, where the various sides line up, walk forward until they were quite close, form up, and now shoot. You go, and they were standing, what was it, about 50 yards apart. Mm -hmm. at each other and just firing off the volleys. And you go... What? That's insane. And then we look at fantasy films that are set in distant pasts that never exist, going, well, that's not how you would do it in the modern day. Mm -hmm. But we don't react that way to how a lot of stuff was done when we see historical fiction. Well, actually, yeah, in historical fiction, they, that is true. They, they were idiots like that. You go, mm -hmm. So why can't they be idiots like that in, in fantasy? Why must it be the modern day? Well, you know, and that's weird because in many respects, it wasn't as idiotic as it may look to us now, right? There were reasons for that hail of bullets being a solid hail. Um, so that's just how wars were fought back then. And a lot of it came down to not just accuracy, but um, speed at which you could, you could reload. And that would decide the entire, you know, the entire thing. So... Um, and then, yeah, one needs to sort of adhere to the reality of the situation you created uh, in your fiction, um, which is different from adhering to a reality that is modern and this world's. They're two different things. Yeah, and that's internal cohesion is more important than um, applying. But again, you have to take into account your modern audience. Sure. You, you know, a modern audience is, is who you're uh, telling the story to. But it, it, is, it is one of those difficulties of trying to read and setting and world building and the location of a story and imposing our understanding of things onto it instead of seeing what the, the narrative is actually trying to communicate. Mm -hmm. it's, it's almost reversing the flow of information. It's Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It should be this way. And you go, no, they didn't have health and safety legislation back then. That's not how a training sequence if a training, if you were training someone with a sword now, you would do it very differently than you would say in the Malazan world, where they go, right, here's a sword, let's go, and you would train them. You wouldn't go, right, is everyone wearing their their padding? Have you all signed your disclaimer? Health and safety has been in. Here's our risk assessment. Um, now, uh, well, we have a very different approach these days, and a different mindset, and it's a different world than. The enemy's invading. Here's a sword. I'm going to teach you the basics to try and keep you alive when the enemy arrives on our doorstep in in 20 days. Yeah, yeah, and and keep it as simple as possible. So none of the the, the whirling and and you know um, overly elaborate sword fighting techniques. I mean, they're they're silly, first of all. But you keep it simple. You put a big barrier between you and your enemy. And you stab from behind it. That's what you do. But, but very Steve, simple. It's very important to do the flourish. No, you know, like, it's not. that's that's how you prove you're a really cool warrior. 
<laughs> yes, apparently, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, Steve, thank you very much for for having this chat with me. I I do appreciate these chats. Yeah, I mean, I I, I just hope this was useful um, for for beginning writers and and I guess readers as well. Eh? So since you're here. <laughs> you're always such a joy yeah for those of you still watching and still seeing me be abused by my friend thank you very much for watching thank you for your continued support and i will see you in the next one